right. Good evening. You can do better than that. Good evening. Uh, it's, my, it's the end of the day. A, thank you. Uh, I, I, on behalf of the faculty uh, and students of the School of Global Policy and Strategy and the Center for Global Transformation, welcome uh, to this inaugural Pacific Leadership Fellows event for this uh, academic year. I'm just going to quickly tell you a little bit about uh, the Center, of Glo Center for Global Transformation, uh, and then my uh, colleague Richard Feinberg is going to introduce our guests for the evening. Um, just CGT is, has been around for several years now, and it's uh, an interdisciplinary center here at UCSD fostering economic growth and research uh, on the countries and economies of the Pacific region, the Pacific Rim broadly construed, uh, focusing on academic inquiry, policy analysis, and in particular, the center sponsors the Pacific Leadership Fellows Program that we are here to uh, take part in tonight. And this is a great program that I'm uh, privileged to coordinate where we bring together uh, leaders from the region uh, in business, in academics, in government, in the nonprofit sector, to be in residence for an extended period of time here at UC San Diego, interacting with uh, our students, our faculty, and with the broader San Diego community uh, on a variety of topics, uh, including the very timely topic of tonight, which is corporate accountability and the future of democracy and human rights. So any one of those clauses you could pull out and it would be timely corporate accountability for a variety of reasons in a whole host of domains, whether it's climate to privacy, uh, to data stewardship, future of democracy is something that I don't think I have to belabor, and this, the extent to which we're going to continue to have a stable and robust human rights regime I think is something we're uh, dealing with right now in a way that we haven't had to uh, possibly since the end of the Cold War. So um, I think this will be a super timely topic and I'm excited to hear what our guests have to say. Um, I just also like to emphasize that the uh, second area of activity for CGT is in uh, funding early stage research and collaborative projects for, among faculty and students uh, around UC San Diego uh, in order to support graduate student research in economics, public policy, international relations, management, uh, and so forth. And none of this would be possible without the uh, continuing generosity of the center's uh, founding donors, Joan and Erwin Jacobs. So the last thing I'll mention is what's coming up next in the, the Pacific Leadership Fellows Program for the year. Uh, and our next guest is going to be uh, Nuru Pamo Rao, the former Indian ambassador to the United States. She'll be here in the beginning weeks of November and the public talk and an analog of this event is currently scheduled for November the 6th. So please uh, put that on your calendars. Uh, without much more, I'd like to introduce Richard Feinberg and he's going to introduce our guests. Well, good evening, everyone, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, as John said, I'm Richard Feinberg, a faculty member here at, at GPS. Uh, it's going to be my really great pleasure to moderate this panel. Uh, tonight, we have a, a double-barreled treat for you. Not just one distinguished Pacific Leadership Fellow, but two Pacific Leadership Fellows. They are a married couple, each very distinguished in their own right but together, as you will see, a really brilliant, dynamic duo. Uh, Bennett Freeman and Rebecca McKinnon, they've enjoyed separate careers working on distinct issue areas, but they share, they share a passion for bridging the gaps between the realms of ideas and the realms of action, between intellectual concepts and public policy, between government, private markets, and business. That makes them a perfect fit for GPS and the Pacific Leadership Fellows Program. And I can testify that every day in their whirlwind of activities, both Bennett and Rebecca are mobilizing research and experience, their own competence and organizational savvy, savvy to make our world a better, more just, and more democratic place. Bennett and I go way back, actually, way back. I had the honor of knowing his distinguished father, who, like, like Bennett himself, his dad was a pioneer in the area of public policy, working on the intersection between government and business, uh, very specifically pioneering the introduction of the service sector into international trade policy. I also had the great pleasure of working with Bennett when I was in the National Security Council at the White House in DC, and he was at the State Department. Remember this, Bennett? <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> we, uh, it was a while ago, but it was during the golden era of American diplomacy. Yes, I think we can say that now with some historical perspective. Um, we worked on NAFTA, we worked on the PESO uh, package, uh, we worked on global democracy and human rights. Uh, Bennett now uh, is a global leader in promoting human rights and sustainable development around the world. Uh, he's an extraordinary public policy entrepreneur. He has helped to create several multi-stakeholder initiatives engaging government, business, and international agencies. Uh, that's a lot of work when you have to corral all of these very different interests in their own, from their, coming from their own space and helping them see where they might converge behind common interests and goals and objectives. Uh, Bennett also works across multiple industries, particularly the extractive sector and relevant to this uh, discussion today, information technology. After graduating from UC Berkeley, just up the road, Bennett studied history at Oxford University. Then he uh, sharpened his skills in US campaign politics. Then he managed public affairs for the General Electric Company. Then he entered the State Department uh, he worked for the storied Stuart Eisenstadt, and he was a speechwriter for Secretary of State Warren Christopher. Uh, then, as a result of his distinguished work, uh, he was given a post as Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor, DHL. Then, after government service, uh, Bennett led Calvert Investments in Sustainability Research and Policy, and now he advises global corporations and sits on numerous boards of major nonprofits working on corporate social responsibility and human rights. Rebecca is equally formidable. She is fluent in Mandarin Chinese. She can hold her own in Japanese, Russian, and French. Whew. When a student at Harvard, she edited the widely read Harvard International Review, which by chance, I just happened to read a couple of articles in just, just yesterday. Uh, during her, Rebecca's distinguished career in journalism, she led the CNN bureaus in Tokyo and Beijing and served as a professor of journalism at the University of Hong Kong. Today, Rebecca is at the New America Foundation in Washington, D.C. There, she directs the project Ranking Digital Rights, which she herself founded. She will explain that project undoubtedly. What that does is produces uh, an annual corporate accountability index which bench benchmarks major internet and telecom companies worldwide against an impressive set of benchmarks. I urge you to check out the website. Uh, it's, it's much superior, much superior to most of the benchmarking initiatives that one sees around, and that's definitely a credit uh, to Rebecca's uh, seriousness as a public policy entrepreneur. Uh, Rebecca is also a board member of the Committee to Protect Journalists. She's a co-founder of Global Voices, a global citizen media network, globalvoices.org, uh, it's a great resource, I highly recommend it. Also, Rebecca has time to write books. Uh, her award-winning book, Consent of the Networked, The Worldwide Struggle for Internet Freedom. It's really essential background reading in this field and also to understand the impetus behind her uh, benchmarking initiatives. So this evening we'll follow this format. Uh, each speaker will take five minutes to offer a conceptual overview of current global trends, positive and dangerous in the global economy, especially in the areas of democracy, human rights, internet privacy, freedom, and corporate accountability. Then each speaker, an take another five minutes, just five minutes, will drill down to explain their own works, their major publications and policy initiatives. They will demonstrate that they, like we, are not passive victims of history. Rather, we can make a difference, okay? Then after that back and forth, we'll engage in a little back and forth among the three of us, and then we'll open it up for audience Q&A, okay? Rebecca, the floor is yours. Wow, Richard, after that, you know, um, yeah. As they say in Chinese. Um, so, how many, let's get a sense of the room. Um, how many people here in the room today were adults and had begun their 
professional career in the 90s or earlier. So a fair, fair number of people remember the 90s and were operating professionally in the 90s, but, but not everybody, um, which, which I, I figured we'd, we'd have a good mix. Um, so Richard was just talking about the 90s, the diplomatic golden age. The uh, Berlin Wall had just fallen, victory for capitalism, victory for democracy. Um, I want to poke a little bit of a hole in the, the, the premise of the golden age uh, and, and to, to point out what I believe was a set of false premises that we are struggling to deal with now. Um, I was in China working for CNN in the 1990s as the two of you were in the State Department doing your diplomacy and actually, you know, I, I was in China when Warren Christopher and, you know, whose speeches were being written by Bennett, uh, it, came, it came to China to, uh, to, to uh, uh, talk about the delinking of MFN, most favored nations, trading status, and so on. Um, and Bennett can talk a bit more about some of that. But the, the premise that was perpetuated by the American policy establishment and the media, uh, I was very much an accomplice in this, and that was really bought into by the nonprofit sector and the, and, and the, human, rights, uh, the human rights world, um, and that really shaped both policy, media narratives, business practices, and sort of the justification behind trade agreements, and even kind of the priorities of human rights advocacy and policy, was the premise that capitalism plus global communications technology, which by the mid-90s was the internet, essentially, would lead us to democracy and greater human rights. And there was a sense of historical inevitability that uh, I believe has caused or contributed to the lack of accountability, lack of corporate accountability uh, in, in a range of ways. Uh, and and that, uh, that we need to deal with. Um, because I do believe that capitalism and the internet are essential to fostering and sustaining democracy and human rights, but they themselves are not intrinsically democratic supporting or human rights supporting. We have to work to make them so. Um, and uh, in, in my book, Consent of the Network, uh, so one core chapter, and then the book was really built around the notion that China, uh, as I had come to, to find in my later work after I left CNN in the 90s, uh, is exhibit A for how an authoritarian state evolves and adapts to survive in the internet age, to use the internet to strengthen its legitimacy and power, and ultimately to adapt to the internet. Uh, and that was very counterintuitive and very hard for many people um, I, I found in the policy community when my book, uh, when I was writing my book in 2010, 2011, came out in, in 2012. Uh, and my sort of warning uh, in the book was that if the corporate sector, but also democratic governments, did not take greater responsibility for how capitalism and technology were being used, the details of how we were operating, that the global internet, that the internet everywhere would be like the Chinese internet, and that we would sort of get a convergence of, of potentially of systems as well. Uh, and uh, so that was considered pretty negative at the time. Uh, unfortunately, people don't find it as sort of uh, naysayer as, as they uh, used to. Um, but I really do believe in sort of the core of my corporate accountability work is that um, as we talk to internet companies, um, it's not that they shouldn't exist, right? I think some of the tech lashes that everything that internet companies do is bad. That's not actually what I think. But they need to be accountable. Technology needs to be operated, governed, 
uh, and designed in a way that supports human rights and democracy, supports and sustains the kind of world we want to have. So it's in a way, it's a broader sustainability argument. Not only do we want companies to sustain the kind of environment that we can live in, but we, we want to hold companies accountable to sustaining the kind of uh, um, world uh, information environment and ultimately political environment that we want for our children. Uh, and that, of course, requires government to do its job as well, which uh, Bennett will talk about. So I'll hand it over to him. Listening to um, Richard's introduction of us, I was wondering who, who these people could be. <laughs> I mean, but thank you. It's a, it's really a pleasure and a privilege to be at UCSD for these couple of weeks, and I want to thank um, Richard um, for the generous, overly generous introductions um, and for friendship uh, going back to the first Clinton administration. Um, Richard's actually not the person I know here uh, for the longest. Um, that distinction, and we won't get too specific about what year it may have been, is Professor Stefan Haggard, uh, who was a graduate student at Berkeley when I was an undergraduate, and the TA for a wonderful uh, course uh, on ancient Greek, Roman, and early Christian political theory. So we go back a couple of years, um, but it's a pleasure to be uh, here with him, and, and Susan Shirk was also a colleague at the State Department to have met so many people, um, Professor Alquist, so many others, um, uh, Professor Gravarevich, um, and Greg Malinger, who um, this, uh, leads this program, uh, working closely with Professor Alquist. So thank you so much for hosting us. So I'm the guy with a couple history degrees, but um, Rebecca and I did a deal that she would take care of the 90s and sort of allude to the 2000s. So I'm going to go right to the present uh, and give you, in just five minutes, my view of the world for what it's worth insofar as it challenges corporate responsibility and accountability, particularly for democracy and human rights. I see three fundamental overlapping challenges, indeed crises, that are now uh, engulfing the world, which each separately and cumulatively pose fundamental challenges to each of us, uh, but also, not least, to multinational corporations. The first is the current geopolitical uh, situation uh, where for the first time in my life I've become uh, not the optimist I've always been um, with the drift towards illiberal democracy in so many of our great democracies, large and small, despite the robust uh, status of democracy in so many other countries. Um, but whether it's the Philippines or Brazil, uh, Poland, Turkey, India, the United States, um, there are fundamental problems now that spill over into the international community and with the retreat and to some degradation of US uh, leadership, the international community itself is shaky. Its institutions, its standards, its norms, its rules, with the US in particular playing less of a constraining or countervailing force than it has in the past to at least um, try to uh, uh, constrain uh, impunity on the part of autocracies, which we're seeing acting with greater impunity, whether it's Russia, uh, China, or Saudi Arabia. So I think we're at a time where the international community is being challenged to its very foundations going back to 1945 with profound implications for multinational corporations among all of us uh, in terms of the need we would like to think of working and operating in a, in a global economy bound by rules. The second challenge, of course, is the climate crisis. And that is one that's been mounting for several decades. And I think that 2019 may be an inflection year where the sense of severity and urgency became more palpably apparent than ever before. And we see it on the streets of London and elsewhere with Extinction Rebellion with, with high school students uh, all around the world now uh, with a demand for action. 
The third challenger crisis is one around global social, economic, and income inequality. And to be careful, this comes at a time when there have been cross-cutting uh, advances, um, where some countries have actually pulled tens of millions, hundreds of millions of people, in the case of China, of course, out of poverty, yet at the same time, uh, income inequality is widening, both in South and in North countries. And interestingly, and I think uh, disturbingly, in North countries, uh, which have the political effect, of course, of fueling populism and authoritarianism and leading us to the illiberal uh, democratic situations that we're seeing in so many countries. So against the backdrop of that geopolitical situation, at least that I see, the climate crisis, with all of that new impetus of severity and urgency, and growing social and economic and income equality with uh, inequality with those political implications, each presents an extraordinary challenge to business, especially to multinational corporations. I've been working within, with, and at times against the corporate world in various roles going back now to the mid-1980s, and I've been fascinated my whole career by the whole debate around corporate purpose. Never in my 35 years or so dealing with multinational corporations from the inside or on the outside have I seen such a debate as has been emerging this year around corporate purpose. Is it shareholder value? And I worked for the avatar, the, the profit, of shareholder value, Jack Welch, CEO of GE. I was there with him mid 80s to the early 90s. Is it shareholder value or is it societal benefit? Or is it some balance in between? The business roundtable, essentially the Fortune 50 companies issued a statement this summer that was widely noted, acknowledging that it's not just shareholder value, it's societal benefit. I thought that statement was little, late, and lame. But after saying that and being unhappy for 30 seconds, I got over it, and I think it's a tremendous step forward. We got to turn the words into actions. But there's a debate now. The Economist um, is not the Bible, um, but it is at times prophetic. And here we go. What are companies for? Big business, shareholders, and society. Uh, Peter Gurevich has been involved in this debate through his academic work. Uh, going back, I think, to the 1970s. Um, I've been involved in it professionally since the 1980s, but it's game on with these huge challenges confronting multinationals with inescapable choices that they must make, and we as citizens, activists, shareholders, voters, are gonna make them make. Round two keeps everybody awake at the end of the day. Um, so, so now we're going to get a little more specific. You know, how in our work have we tried to hold companies accountable and and bring about change and and to get uh, uh, the corporate world to, in fact, uh, benefit other stakeholders. And and the good news is is that it didn't take. We didn't all wait around for the business roundtable to tell us that that uh, other stakeholders needed to be taken into account before many of us started working on this. Um, so how have, how, what have I learned uh, about holding companies accountable? Um, I'll talk in a minute very, uh, a bit more specifically about the ranking digital rights uh, pro program that I run out of New America and our corporate accountability index, which is sort of like many of you, I think, know about Freedom House and their Freedom in the world rankings, freedom, freedom of the, of the press, freedom on the net. We, that's a ranking of countries. We rank companies. We we rank the world's biggest internet, mobile, and telecommunications companies. You know, not as many as we like because of resources. But if you take the ones we do do evaluate and put them all together, they touch the digital lives of most people, most internet users on the planet. Uh, so so we grade them, but. But how, how, before I get into the specifics of what we do, I want to talk for a minute about, or two, about uh, kind of how, how we get 
how, how my colleagues and I got to doing a, a ranking. And one of the key things about actually getting companies to pay attention and to take action to improve their policies, to improve their practices, is that you have to get beyond just saying, you're doing bad stuff. So, so you know, I've been in plenty of meetings where people go, you know, say, for example, in the, in the mid-thousands, people were going to Yahoo and Microsoft and saying, and Google and saying, you're complicit with Chinese internet censorship, you need to stop, and you're really bad. Um, and then the companies say, well, what should we be doing differently, you know, et cetera, what do you want us to do? And so that's where you kind of start the, the real conversation is having a constructive conversation of precisely what you want them to do differently uh, and what is possible, how you get from where they are now to where you want them to go. And technically what you need to change in ter terms of your business practices and processes, what do you need to change? And an example of a conversation that, uh, that, that I was involved with and that Bennett was actually involved with uh, in the mid-thousands uh, was after the US, um, I, I mean, after Google, Yahoo, Microsoft, and Cisco were hauled in front of Congress for their actions that, you know, Google took its search engine into China and Yahoo was found to be complicit in helping uh, to jail journalists and dissidents and Microsoft was censoring Chinese bloggers. Uh, Cisco was contributing to the uh, censorship infrastructure, uh, and they were called into Congress and yelled at and, and threatened in various ways with various regulation. And so the companies realized they needed to actually sit down with human rights experts, researchers, and responsible investors like Bennett and say, okay, so what are the standards we need to apply when we're faced with government demands uh, in places like China? And, and we sat down with them and said, okay, so for example, with Microsoft, they used to run a blogging platform, and they had taken down a Chinese blogger um, uh, on, on demand from some, a Chinese police office in Shanghai. It's like, did you even get the order on paper? Do you have any process, process for evaluating the demands? Are you being, we said to Yahoo, are you being transparent at all with your users about where the data is stored so they know whether or not they should even be using your email service for something that's politically sensitive. How, how responsible are you being? It's, it's not just a question of being in China or not being in China, it's about how you're being in China. And you know, because the companies were initially just trying to get us to say, well, you know, what, what do you expect us to do? We're in China, we have to do what the government asks. And, and we, we broke it down in terms of specifically what your business does and how you can be more clear with your users about the risks they face, how you can be more responsible about whether or not you're responding to certain government demands that might not even be legal in their own system. Um, and, and so that's, that eventually led to something called the Global Network Initiative, which set forth some principles around how companies need to be transparent, need to be conducting risk assessments, uh, need to do due diligence about how they're dealing with government demands around the world because there's almost no market where companies are not getting censorship and surveillance demands uh, and there's few markets where one can where nobody thinks that that is violating rights of some kind so companies have to deal with that in a global context we came up with a set of principles a process for evaluating whether companies were following the principles one could do a five-hour lecture on how well that's worked or not but it has i believe uh, prevented things from being a lot worse than they might have otherwise been. Um, but um, this leads me to ranking digital rights because we were having companies commit pr to principles around government demands and again get evaluated on them, but it was companies were opting in, they were being evaluated on a very small set of practices, they were not being evaluated about uh, what you're doing with commercial data and whether you're abusing uh, customers' privacy and your commercial practices. Uh, it was not dealing with a lot of security questions. It was not dealing with, you know, how you're managing content online and you're moderating content online um, and its impact on people. So uh, we developed a methodology. Um, uh, I got together with some colleagues, raised a bit of funds to hire some other researchers. Um, we spent 
a few years developing a methodology, consulting with experts, with companies as well, um, and, uh, and piloted it, and then eventually in 2015 released our, our first index, um, evaluating a couple dozen companies on 35 different indicators, looking very, very specifically at does the company disclose this? Is its policy, does it do human rights impact assess assessments on these things? Are they actually disclosing to users what they're doing with people's data or who they are, who has power to access their data under what circumstances? Who has power to shape people's speech or access to information under what circumstances through their platforms? And so we score the companies. We're tough grader, highest score is a D, et cetera. But uh, we, we have managed to get companies to make some concrete changes. And since this is not a presentation about the whole thing, I won't get into all the details, but um, most of the companies in the index have made policy changes and improved disclosures on the basis of our evaluation. And interestingly enough, and I'll just close on this, um, even the two Chinese companies in our index have made changes in response to how they got evaluated. Now, they made no changes that relate to government demands for reasons that are probably pretty obvious, but they have made changes improvements on their disclosures about how they're handling consumer data for commercial purposes. They've, they've, they've made improvements on some of their security policies and practices in terms of just securing people's information and so on. So, so it's kind of interesting to see that even the companies that are in the most difficult environments um, do want to improve their public reputations if they have a global customer base at all. Uh, and, and so um, with that, I'll leave it there. And I know Richard has some more questions about it. But, but the key is to be very, very concrete. Show them data. Show them facts. Show them how their policies are impacting real people. And then you can move the ball. So one of the um, pleasures of, I could say personally, of my relationship with Rebecca uh, has been, it's been a professional as well as a personal relationship working together uh, off and on, but constantly learning from each other. And I'll give really two examples that, to just give you some insight, uh, further insight, not only into her work, but our work and some of the crossovers. And then I'll turn very briefly to a, another area of my current work. But um, Rebecca and I met as co-founders of the Global Network Initiative, as she's uh, referenced already. And this was a group of companies, NGOs, academic experts, and responsible investors who came together from 2006 to 2008 to see if we could set a global standard for corporate transparency and accountability around freedom of expression and right to privacy online, particularly connected to government requests for data. Rebecca came to that exercise uh, as a China expert, given her, her role with CNN in Beijing, but as a budding expert on Chinese internet uh, ex uh, censorship. I came to the discussion with a little bit of China, uh, US foreign policy China expertise, and no tech expertise whatsoever, let alone on Chinese internet censorship. Um, but what I did come equipped with was having had the chance when I was in my last job at the State Department to conceive and pull together an initiative that brought the biggest US and UK oil and mining companies in the same room with Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch together with the State Department and the UK Foreign Office, and we created uh, what became the Global Human Rights Standard for Oil and Mining, the Voluntary Principles on Security and Human Rights. So I came to the, to the uh, party here in 06 to 08 when we first met with experience putting together a comparable multi-stakeholder initiative, setting standards around corporate accountability for human rights in a totally different sector how, what could be more different than extractives and internet, and yet the same fundamental issues in that in both cases, the tech companies and the extractive companies were not trying to perpetrate human rights abuses, but instead were operating in circumstances 
where they appeared to be, and in some cases, unfortunately, were complicit with human rights abuses perpetrated mostly by the home country, uh, the host country governments of the countries where they were operating, whether on the ground, in the mines or jungles, uh, uh, mining or drilling for oil, or in cyberspace. So a lot of commonality. A second overlap, you just heard Rebecca talk about ranking digital rights, which has been a truly innovative um, and influential agenda uh, initiative that she began to develop after her book was published. And at the same time, I was a co-founder beginning in 2013 on behalf of Calvert of an even broader uh, human rights corporate human rights benchmarking initiative, which indeed is called the Corporate Human Rights Benchmark Initiative. And we rank companies on a wider range of human rights indicators in the apparel, agriculture, and extractive sectors, and now in the tech sector on value chain and supply chain labor to complement and not duplicate the digital rights work that Rebecca does. So I did that on behalf of Calvert with half a dozen others uh, in the human rights community, the investment community, and elsewhere. But we were developing these parallel complementary uh, uh, rankings initiatives at the same time, and I think it's fair to say feeding off of each other's parallel work. I'll just turn briefly to the focus of my work, I'd say the preponderant focus of my work the last two years um, in researching, outlining, writing, editing, and then presenting the last year a, a, a report um, that really gets to the first big challenge that I posited 10 or 15 minutes ago around the closing of civil society space, democracies becoming illiberal, countries with autocratic governments operating with, even, governments that are autocratic rather, operating with even greater impunity. And I had been inspired initially to get into the business and human rights uh, arena uh, when I was in the Human Rights Bureau in the late 90s at State by a terrible incident some of you are aware of in 1995, where Shell was considered to be complicit in the, ex in the execution of Ken Sarawiwa, a Nigerian environmental activist, human rights activist and writer, and eight colleagues of his by the Nigerian military junta at the time. Um, and Shell, as the dominant oil producer in the Niger Delta region of that country, um, was considered to have done not enough to avert those executions. A firestorm of criticism, the contemporary business and human rights agenda born. Here we are, coming up on a quarter century after Shell and Ken Sarawiwa, Nigeria, and we have civil society activists, human rights defenders under pressure and attack all around the world, particularly in Southeast Asia and Latin America, but in every other region of the world. Uh, and I was inspired by the legacy of, 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 of Ken Sarawiva and Yagoni 8, but my work in the business and human rights world, to revisit the dilemma that Shell faced, what to do, how to act in that kind of an extreme circumstance. So I've developed, with the help of a lot of people, not least the 90 plus people interviewed for the, for the project, a report called Shared Space Under Pressure, Business Support for Civic Freedoms and Human Rights Defenders, commissioned by the Business and Human Rights Resource Center and International Service for Human Rights. Uh, and the report lays out a normative framework for companies to decide whether and if so how to act on behalf of civic freedoms and human rights defenders in really tough situations around the world. So I've been on a year-long plus roadshow, uh, universities, think tanks, conferences, but I'm now going to where the action is which is not presenting the report in front of 25, 50, or 100 people. I'm going into conference rooms with five or 10 people in the room, mostly companies who are decision makers. And two weeks ago today, I presented the report at Shell's headquarters in The Hague. I'll be seeing Total and BP in a few weeks uh, in London and uh, Paris and London, respectively. And what I'm trying to do is to move the needle, however modestly, however incrementally, to give companies criteria, tools to decide what they can do and how they can do it, privately, quietly, behind the scenes, or sometimes publicly. But there's a shared space that companies 
can and must recognize a shared space of civil society, rule of law, accountable governance, basic civic freedoms, the lifeblood of civil society, also the lifeblood of sustainable, responsible business, of innovation, of entrepreneurship. So what my colleagues and I are trying to do through this shared space agenda is to find points of common interest, of connection between large multinationals and courageous human rights defenders in far corners of the world and see if they can stand together. Uh, both of you uh, are uh, driving two important reports, uh, which are the result of a great deal of work by yourselves and many colleagues. They culminate and pull together uh, a great deal of previous work. Uh, in both cases, the goal, as I understand it, of these reports uh, is not just to shame companies, it's not just to denounce them, uh, it's not to eliminate them in some unreal world, but rather to, as Bennett said, move the needle. Uh, if you all could just elaborate a little bit, you've already touched on this, how does one go about using these public reports uh, to get these large behemoth multinational corporations uh, to do the right thing? Sure, um, so, so it's, it's again, providing them with very specific frameworks that are credible. So, so the, the methodology that we use at Ranking Digital Rights to evaluate companies wasn't just sort of Rebecca McKinnon's view of what companies ought to do. It represents several years of, of research into what are existing standards around privacy, around security, around freedom of expression, built on UN human rights principles, UN guiding principles for business and human rights to which many multinationals have made commitments. So, so we were building on things that companies recognized uh, as things that they've said good things about that they wanted to aspire to. Um, we also, I think what's very important in getting companies to understand what they need to do to change is not only to see that there's a whole community of experts and human rights groups and, and others behind the methodology that's being used to evaluate them, but they see it coming. So that when you start evaluating them, they, they knew it was coming and they had a chance to actually prepare. So they had a chance to make changes in advance if they wanted to. And actually some companies already started making changes before we started evaluating them because they'd seen drafts of our methodology, which we posted online and did workshops at, at conferences where many companies work. And, and then when we start a research cycle, we contact the companies and say, here's our methodology for this year, here's how it changed from last year, um, and uh, in XYZ, you know, at XYZ time, we're going to send you our, our draft results and you're gonna have six weeks to get back to us if, if you disagree or if you wanna discuss. So we engage with companies along the way. So, so that again gives them an opportunity internally to understand. Um, and one other thing that's really important uh, is that companies are not monoliths. And, and, and also this is where, you know, companies are not bad guys per se, right? Um, although sometimes they're portrayed that way. There are a lot of people working in these companies, particularly people whose job it is to work on privacy, people whose job it is to, to um, you know, in many of the US-based uh, platforms now, they produce transparency reports that report data about the number of government demands they get and so on. And those people, if, if, you, if you're evaluating their level of transparency and you find it lacking, they really care. And, and so when I, I, I run into a lot of people who work at these companies, and a number of people in several companies have come up to me and said, we're really glad you did this 
And it was really helpful that you gave us a bad score on that particular indicator because I was finally able to get my boss to pay attention and to care about this that I've been sort of waving my hand about for years and finally I got resources to deal with it. Um, and, and so this is one of the key things, and Betty can talk about this too, there are internal champions in a lot of these companies, unless they're arms dealers or a company that kind of fundamentally is, is, is you know, selling you know, spyware or something. Um, it, you know, most people in these companies want to feel that they are doing good, that their company is a force for, for good in the world. And so when you give them a very specific thing to hang on to, to grab onto for how they can help their company do better and have a conversation about it, and also data about what their competitors are doing. You know, that there, there might be some certain things that one company is doing better than the other and they didn't realize it until you kind of did a com comparison. Um, it it, it, makes it makes a difference. Well, what, one thing I want to tease out a little bit here, particularly for the students, is for you to grasp how much work goes in to this sort of civil society effort. That it's a constant iterative process, uh, back and forth. It's constant uh, drilling down to detail. And it's about building coalitions, not only within civil society, across governments worldwide, but within companies. Just as we talk about disaggregating the state you have to disaggregate each company to find out who are your allies within firms that can then uh, move the needle forward. But if I could just shift Grant a little bit uh, for your, let's say, response. Uh, you, you, you opened your remarks talking about the shift in global politics, particularly here in the United States. Uh, during the Obama era, uh, companies might have thought it was simply good public policy to at least put themselves on the right side of sustainability, advocacy, and democracy, because that's what Washington wanted to hear. Now, with Washington having a very different uh, uh, point of view on a lot of these issues, how have companies adapted? Do you find that this creates a significant difference in your ability to dialogue with companies, uh, or are they responding to other constituencies, other sh uh, shareholders, other incentives? Great question. Thank you, Richard, for that. So I think that um, maybe paradoxically, but to me not so uh, uh, oddly, the political disruption we've seen in the United States and globally since 2016 uh, has actually been a impetus for corporations to speak out on some pretty tough social and indeed political issues to a greater extent than have been the case. And that's because uh, they have seen uh, whole areas of, I don't want to say settled policy, but at least broad bipartisan consensus disrupted. Exhibit A, climate. A lot of progress the last dozen years, even in corporate America, towards getting companies to get off climate denial. There's still a few laggards uh, to get on the bandwagon, whether it was cap and trade a dozen years ago or a carbon tax, to try to set and meet emissions reductions targets. And then all of a sudden, the current occupant of the Oval Office pulls the plug on the US and the Paris Climate Agreement in June of 2017. And the response from most of corporate America was, we're gonna double down. You take us out, we're not going out, we're doubling down to meet the, the emissions reductions targets, and it's not just corporate America, it's huge investors. And it's the great states and cities led by the state of California uh, that have gone their own way, and now there's a, a, a fight in the courts with some of the companies lining up on the side of the state of California. It's interestingly, auto companies on emissions reduction standards. Exhibit B. Charlottesville, we won't even need to repeat what was said there. CEO after CEO, 24, 48, 72 hours, disassociate themselves, rebuke the current occupant of the Oval Office, resign from those White House advisory councils. Uh, there are other examples. C, quickly, immigration. Company after company separating themselves from the optics of being associated, however indirectly, with an administration who 
wants to throw the dreamers out of the United States of America and separate families and infant children at the U.S.-Mexican border. Lots of corporate leaders and lots of impetus, not just from the top of these companies, but more importantly, uh, coming from the bottoms up, from, from employees, particularly but not exclusively in the tech sector. So I'm seeing companies in the U.S. step up in ways that I have not through my career working with, with corporate America. That said, and this is um, really an important point to me personally, and I say this as somebody who spent the last two decades working full time on corporate accountability and off and on for 35 years on that long before when I was at GE, um, I am all for corporate responsibility and accountability, but not at the expense of fundamental public policy, whether it's regulation, legislation, legal enforcement. Um, corporate responsibility m can supplement, must supplement, but in my opinion, must not supplant government responsibility. And I think that this whole corporate responsibility and accountability debate, argument, shareholder value versus societal benefit, climate crisis, business and human rights is a proxy for an even more fundamental debate over roles and responsibilities. Public versus private sector, corporations versus governments, and I know where I come down, which is fundamentally on the side of democratic governance and civil society calling the shots. But we need now, in the current situation in the United States and globally, we need these companies to step up. But that's not a long-term panacea. It's a partial short-term solution, but we need to have a more balanced, sustainable approach to governance and to policy. Great, brilliant, brilliant wrap-up. Let me now uh, open this up to uh, Q&A. Uh, we have about 15 minutes, I think. Uh, I'll, take a, I'll take a round of questions, I think. Professor, start off, and we'll take a couple. Go ahead, yeah. If, if I could just ask people to state their name and identification, and uh, mics are coming around. Uh, this is Victor Shi from uh, GPS, I teach here. I teach China. So um, my question will be a very obvious one, which is uh, what ha how do you advise corporations who run into a nation state actor which will guarantee you a reduction in revenue if you engage in human rights issues or civil society in that country? What, what's your recommendation? Right, that's such a neurologic question. Why don't we just take that on its own, Rebecca? Sure. Well, they're short-term and long-term, right? So, so um, you know, we're we're at a point now where, uh, you know, the Chinese government is sort of bullying companies about Hong Kong, right? Uh, and it's and it feels it can do that because everybody's been rolling over and playing dead for 30 years, right? Uh, and if companies had st had been st again, and this also relates a, a bit to. Bennett's shared space report where, you know, you're not expecting companies to be human rights watch and issue statements about everything, right? But in areas that relate to your business or relate to your workers and their rights or relate to information about your company, um, you know, over time, if you continuously fail to stand up for freedom of information, for freedom of association, in, in areas that your business touches, the space is going to shrink further, and it's going to get harder and harder for you to do business, and it's going to get harder for you to use courts or anything else to, to, to try and have a, a fair operating environment. You know what you do now, of course, is you know we we are we've gone very far down the road, um, but I, I think companies are now being faced with you know, what do we represent? What kind of world do we want? Uh, future generations to live in, and and where do we stand in that regard, and what do we want our company to be associated with long term versus the next four quarters profits, which is that's a tough one, uh, or you know, thirty years from now, if something changes, will the public remember whose side you were on, right, and and what will that do for your business eventually? The problem is, of course, that. Oftentimes, companies aren't thinking that, that far in advance. 
Really quickly on this one, if I can. I mean, there, I, there's so many examples, but one I'm particularly familiar with is uh, conflict minerals and, and Democratic Republic of Congo. I had the chance both as senior VP at Calvert, but also as chair of the advisory board of Global Witness, which did a, a huge amount to drive that legislation in the US um, to engage with companies. And not a lot of companies were thrilled about spending a lot of money to trace any semblance of those so-called conflict minerals that have been fueling the deadliest conflict in the world since the end of World War II in, in Congo. But they began to see the merit of demonstrating to regulators, to customers, and to their own employees that they take and share responsibility for human rights risks and consequences across their value chain. It's an expensive proposition, but Apple, Microsoft, GE, multinationals of that stature um, have made the investments to deal with those issues because they understand the trade-offs between operations and reputations between short and long term. I can't resist just a quick aside on the current situation in Hong Kong, and it relates very much to Rebecca's experience uh, as a journalist in Beijing and as a professor of journalism in Hong at Hong Kong U and the shared space report here. Companies do not want to pick a fight for good reasons or get crosswise with the government in Beijing. Um, and I wouldn't advise that they do so. On the other hand, there are some actions that Beijing has been taking that, at least in my opinion, just can't be tolerated. A line has to be drawn. And one place where that line can and I think should be drawn is when there has been pressure from authorities in Hong Kong or directly from Beijing on companies like Cathay Pacific to discipline or terminate employees who on their own time, not while working as ticket agents or flight attendants or pilots or whatever, on their own time, off time, are participating as citizens in those protests. A line's got to be drawn somewhere, at least there. Some are having a hard time even drawing that line. But this is, right now in real time, a test of this whole shared space concept. If there's really going to be one country, two systems, the two systems have to rely on civic freedoms surviving in Hong Kong, and companies have a stake in that. OK, thanks. Terrific. Uh, was there a question over here? Yeah, Peter. Yeah, I'm Peter Gorovich. I'm a, oh, sorry. Hi, I'm, I'm Peter Gorovich. I'm an emeritus professor here at GPS. I wonder if you could talk a so, little bit more about corporate governance, that is, the relationship between uh, shareholders, employees, uh, board of directors, the executives. Is there any version, is there any type of corporate governance that you think is, makes the firm more accountable on these various issues or less accountable? There's some discussion of this these days. And um, Elizabeth Warren, for example, as you may know, proposed to make mem employees have 40 seats on the board, which is the German model. And I wonder if you could uh, comment on whether you think that we know anything about whether those changes would make any difference to issues of accountability that interest you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, let, let me, let me yeah. I'm going to take a couple take of a questions. Couple yeah, I think corporate governance, if, you, if you're yeah. talking about the skewed distribution of income, let's start with corporate governance. Yep. OK, yes, ma'am. Identify good, yourself, please. Good evening. Thank you for sharing your research. My name is Daphne Galang. I'm a UC alumna. I uh, went further on to do leadership research in healthcare administration and also did some higher education administration. Uh, I was interested in uh, your mention of the privacy industry, and I just want to see if you had any comments about uh, is it information technology accessibility through the administrative side on these um, private companies uh, for financial, academic, and medical records. Did you get that? In information, technology, privacy, and medical rights, did you say? Um, to, to rephrase it, uh, I know you have both done rankings for the corporate corporations. Was there any consideration for, uh, I mentioned financial, academic, and medical records and their access through uh, IT departments as being 
part of the issue about rights violation or, or at least um, security issues. Okay, let me say one more. There was a hand over there. Yes, sir, in the back. You. Hi, I'm Joe. I'm a grad student at GPS. And um, Rebecca, thank you both for being here, by the way. Um, uh, hearing you talk about um, you know, China and um, censorship, I was thinking that in some ways in the US we have the opposite problem of you know, uh, maybe too much free speech in a way where we have a promotion of um, false news and uh, you know, lies and all that. And I'm curious, first of all, your thoughts on that. And then second of all, if you think that there's a framework that can be applied similar to the framework you designed for China. Okay, three, three great issues here. You don't have to all respond to all three. Why don't you be selective? I'm gonna do governance, but I think Rebecca gets the other two. Okay. Which, whichever order you wanna do. Okay. Rebecca. Oh, okay. Um, so, so going in reverse order, um, so with, with disinformation, yeah, I mean, in, in this, not just in the United States, but all across the democratic world, you see this in, in Europe as well, extremists have weaponized the cause of free, free expression um, in, in ways that are, of course, very troubling um, and, and have, have sort of taken advantage of, of free expression values to, to perpetrate um, hate speech and, and also, uh, have, but have also taken advantage of the business models of platforms um, particularly Facebook and, and, and YouTube um, that really optimize for engagement because they're trying to optimize for traffic so to, to, in order to maximize advertising revenue. And that's not a free speech issue, that's a business model issue. Um, and and so, so it's all kind of tied together. Uh, and, and, and sometimes some people say, you know, well, we have freedom of expression and therefore we should be able to do whatever we want on the internet and you know, leave it all alone. Um, However, we also have this situation where the, the platforms on which the speech is taking place are really designed to maximize inflammatory, maximize the travel and reach and volume of inflammatory, controversial speech. Um, so, and, and, and also, it turns out, incentivize people who want to perpetrate violence, you know, all, all, all kinds of things, right? And this also relates to Peter's governance question a little bit in that the companies themselves um, never really conducted any kind of impact assessment about what are the harms that could potentially occur from this business model from the way we are sucking up everybody's data and enabling advert and sharing it with advertisers in a way that they can target micro segments of the population. You know, if you're running a disinformation campaign, you can do it in a very targeted way to the people who are most vulnerable to it. Um, and, and that's in part due to lack of regulation and it's in part due to complete lack of governance and oversight in the company over the types of harms that might occur from the business model and whether this needs to be constrained in any way. Um, so, so there's the speech issue, which we, we need to deal with. And you know, there's some kind of really frustrating debates where in many democracies now, you have sort of right-wing extremists calling for freedom of expression, and you have people more on the left calling for censorship. And then my friends who are dissidents in Egypt and, and in any number of other places are going, oh my God, this is gonna end badly for us all. Um, and, <laughs> and, and the policy responses are all very short-term and knee-jerk coming from governments. Um, and, and so, yeah, we, we don't have a clear framework um, but it, it actually, I, I think, in part comes down to governments failing to do their job in, in protecting citizens from abuse in terms of regulation, more around data than, than I think speech, and more around business models, again, than speech. I think that's where the real regulatory failure is. Um, and uh, 
uh, yeah, um, so so that's and and so that's something I, I think we we need to think about is is that kind of what what is the model? How do we constrain abuse across different actors? Rebecca, if um, I could just follow up on this, could sure. you, you had a, an op-ed in the Financial Times mm -hmm. about a year ago, specifically focusing on these issues and Facebook. And as I recall your argument, you said there was a, a real tension or contradiction between the Facebook business model and doing the right thing on some of these issues of privacy. Uh, so do you think in, over the last year, Facebook has shown greater interest in trying to tackle these issues? And or uh, you would seem to hint in your discussion just now that public policy really must fill this gap. In which case, is it Europe that we would look to for leadership in this area primarily? Uh, or, or how do you oh, yeah. see the public so, policy moving forward? So I, I, I think we need to, I, so European, the fact that European, that Europe has data protection law at all is a good thing. Whether we want to copy it lock, stock, and barrel, no, there are some things about it that I think will work, some things about it that, that, that I, I think won't, and that's a whole other panel. Um, but uh, with, will Facebook kind of recognize, based on my interactions with Facebook, they're willing to talk about their content moderation system and fact checking and you know various things they can do to, to, to kind of slow down the flow of disinformation and you know they're setting up a, a, a sort of Supreme Court kind of external board to help review cases when you know whether content should be taken down or not, but they will not talk about their business model, and um, you know what we're trying to tell them actually we're we're upgrading our indicators in in ranking digital rights for the next round where we're going to be evaluating companies on much more specific questions about targeted advertising business models and at this point we're not saying you know you shouldn't do advertise target advertising at all but if you're going to do it these are the things you need to disclose these are the practices you need to draw the line at um, it, the, these are the types of behaviors you need to prohibit, uh, and so on. And we want to have a conversation about that. So far, Facebook hasn't been so willing to, to, to do that, and their, their policies around giving users control over how their data is shared um, are, are lacking and have not improved that much. Thank you. Interesting. Bennett? Yeah, I'd like to come to Peter's question on governance, and it's a subject that I gained some insight around um, in my role at Calvert Investments where we challenged um, some of the biggest multinational corporations in the world around governance of environmental and social, including human rights issues. So I would love to see workers, employees on corporate boards in the US. That's the German model. I think it's gonna be pretty difficult um, even if there's a significant change in next year's elections here. And it'll be difficult partly because, as we know well, um, union representation is contracted so severely in the private sector in the U.S. Uh, and I think that it would be difficult to figure out exactly you know, which employees should be represented um, and how they're, how they're identified. That's the tough part. Um, but even without that kind of a German model or some variant of it, we have so much work to do now, and we've been making some progress. Um, my team at Calvert um, uh, filed or co-filed 60 plus resolutions uh, with different companies over the years when we were, I was there to put women on boards in corporate America. There's a comparable effort in the UK that's now uh, actually the focus of regulatory requirements uh, in Germany and elsewhere uh, in Europe. Um, but the fact remains that too many American corporate boards, to coin a phrase, remain male, pale, and stale. <laughs> so we have a lot of work to cut out right there. And then let's talk about the issues that corporate boards need to address in this context of balancing shareholder value versus societal benefit. There are some few world-class sustainability and environmental experts on major corporate boards. There need to be many, many more. I can't think of a single major corporate board in corporate America, and I certainly don't know all of them, but I think in this area I would be aware of it. 
that has a serious human rights advocate or expert. The only exception is the Coca-Cola board where Alexis Herman serves, who had served as Secretary of Labor uh, in the first Obama administration, um, excuse me, in the second Clinton administration. Um, I'm dating myself, and long before that had been very active in the civil rights movement in the US. She's the one exception, that's the one company I can think of. Uh, tell me if I'm wrong. We need people with human rights expertise, with environment, with labor expertise. The corporate boards need to look more like America, just as they do in Europe, and both sides of the Atlantic. We are far more uh, multicultural and diverse, and our corporate boards and governance does not recognize that either in terms of our, 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 that diversity or the kinds of expertise and experience that need to guide these companies. I, 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 want, I failed to answer the other question, okay. which I'll do real okay. quickly, um, which is whether we evaluate financial and medical privacy uh, and, and companies' um, uh, uh, practices there. We are only evaluating sort of the internet platforms, so like Facebook, Google, Twitter, Microsoft, uh, Apple, Samsung, uh, and and then telecommunications companies that that provide your your mobile data service or your you know your ISP. So we're not evaluating companies that whose business is to handle medical information or financial information specifically. Although certainly Microsoft and 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 others with their cloud services you know touch on you know Google touch on that a lot with their their business services um, but our our criteria our methodology many parts of it in terms of the types of practices and disclosures we're looking for um, by any company that is processing personal data uh, or or handles handles speech um, that that the the methodology could be applied or adapted to lots of different other types of companies. And, and we sometimes work with, with groups that, that are looking to adapt our methodology to more specific sectors that overlap but aren't exactly the same as the companies we evaluate. Thanks so much. Before, before we break for... Okay, thanks. Uh, before we break for refreshments, uh, I'll reserve for myself the last wrap-up question, if you will. Uh, let me take this to a slightly more personal level. So you all have been extremely active uh, in public affairs, in government, private sector, et cetera, a very practical, detailed way. But beneath all of this, I sense, on the part of both of you, a strong moral impetus, a drive for virtue. What are the roots of your moral passions? Well. Um, I, I guess it depends on how far back you want to go. Uh, when I was seven, my parents uprooted me. They got a Fulbright to do research in India for half a year, and they uprooted me and my brother from suburban Tempe, Arizona, middle class, raised on Sesame Street, and everybody shares, and you know, so on, and and plopped down in in India of the in New Delhi of the 70s. And it's like, oh my God, um, uh, explain this to me. How can people let other people live like this? Uh, so, so I think it started then. Uh, but, but also, uh, sort of as an adult, um, I was in China for nine years with CNN. I got to know the families of people who were in jail for political reasons. I got to know people who got arrested and then came out and as broken people. Um, you know, I, I had friends who were questioned because they knew me. So, so human rights was a very direct and personal and, and tangible, uh, has, has been a very uh, direct thing for me since the beginning of my career. Okay, well, thank you for sharing that, Bennett. Yeah, I really appreciate the question, Richard. So, um, for me, you know, it's 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 generational, it's geographical, it's it's very personal with my family. But you know, I grew up in the city of San Francisco in the 1960s and the first half of the 1970s. Um, admits the war in Vietnam, watching the body counts on the CBS Evening News with Walter Cronkite as a kid, watching the civil rights movement um, uh, unfold. 
um, seeing the origins of the environmental movement, um, leading a student mobilization committee against the Vietnam War in my junior high for a couple of meetings, going to the first Earth Day as a junior high student uh, in San Francisco in spring of 1970. I spent the summer between my the ninth and 10th grade years writing a report for the Sierra Club on water pollution issues facing San Francisco Bay. So you grow up in San Francisco and you see those things happening around you um, and it makes a huge, huge impression. Watergate happened when I was in high school. I was the, lucky enough to be the editor of my high school paper. We did investigative journalism to hold the administration accountable. So then you go to Berkeley in my case, <laughs> mid to late 70s and the you know, the free speech movement was in the rearview mirror, but it still looked and felt like activist Berkeley. So I studied riots, rebellions, and revolutions. I did the Peasants' Revolt of 1381 in England in my senior honors thesis, and at Berkeley and at Oxford, I really went contemporary and marketable and did the English Revolution of the 1640s. You know, and so that's what I've been about, and you grow up in the 60s and 70s in San Francisco and Berkeley, and you make a decision that's not that hard that you're gonna try. Try to dedicate your career to improving the world. You know, however modestly you can do it, you try. Um, and then just one other final point, and this is actually the more practical one, um, and I really appreciate the fact that Richard worked with my late father who passed away in 2011. But my father was um, a, a person with remarkable intellect and conscience, but where he really inspired me was having done a, had an interesting career in the US government and then in the corporate world and really showed me through his career transition that you can make a difference for the good in both the public and the private sectors. So that was very inspiring to me. Uh, thank you both very much for sharing your personal thoughts as well as, uh, I hope, in, uh, inspiring all of us to think about what we can do to make the world a better place. So thank you all very, very much. <laughs>